Padua, 1609. Working on a cold winter's night from his garden near the Basilica of St. Anthony, Galileo Galilei points his newly invented telescope to the sky. He is amazed. A new and fascinating world unfolds before his eyes, the world of stars and planets. Until then, astronomers had relied on observations with the naked eye, but the human eye can't collect much light because of its small entry pupil. By using a one-inch lens, Galileo can see fainter objects with his telescope than with the unaided eye. It also gives sharper images, so that finer details can be seen. Although the increase in light collecting power is modest, the astronomical results are truly revolutionary. Looking at the faintly glowing Milky Way band which spans the sky, Galileo immediately realises that it's comprised of a mass of stars. On the 7th of January, 1610, he discovers three points of light near Jupiter and correctly understands that they are moons revolving around this planet. It's like a small solar system, and Galileo senses that Copernicus is right. The Earth must move around the Sun in a similar way. And, as he trains his telescope on Venus, he discovers that it has phases, just like the Moon. This is the strongest proof yet of the heliocentric world model. Three centuries later, a young American astronomer commences work on a new telescope at the Mount Wilson Observatory in California. It has a primary mirror of 100 inches, 100 times larger than Galileo's. It is the largest optical telescope in the world. And with it, the young astronomer is about to make a major discovery. His name, Edwin Powell Hubble. The superior performance of the new telescope allows Hubble to study individual stars in the Great Andromeda Nebula. It is the biggest of the mysterious nebulae seen in the sky, and its nature is being intensely debated by astronomers. His detailed studies enable him to measure the distance. He proves convincingly that it is a galaxy, at an enormous distance from us, far outside our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Again, a new telescope has dramatically widened our observational horizon, and again astronomers can announce to the world that the universe is much larger and much more complex than ever thought before. Just 80 years later, on a remote mountain top in the Atacama Desert, the world's biggest optical telescope, the 16-meter ESO VLT, points towards the sky for the first time. The VLT represents a breakthrough in telescope technology, enabling astronomers to observe fainter and more distant galaxies than with any other telescope. It has been built by the European Southern Observatory with the support of eight European countries. A dream is coming true. It has taken a long time to get so far. This is the tale of the ESO Very Large Telescope. In 1976, at the European Southern Observatory's site on Cerro La Silla in the Chilean Atacama Desert, the new 3.6-metre telescope enters the final test phase. It is a milestone for ESO, and also for European science. For the first time since the First World War, European astronomers now have access to a truly up-to-date telescope, of a size and with a performance that is comparable to the best telescopes in the United States. The telescope is computer-controlled, and the astronomers work in front of TV screens in a control room. It is a far cry from Galileo's and Hubble's telescopes. Astronomy has become a high-tech science. But competition in science is intense. Several new telescopes, like the ESO 3.6-metre telescope, enter into operation during this period, and some astronomers are already thinking about a next generation of instruments. 
In December 1977, scientists from all over the world gather at ESO, then at CERN in Geneva, to prepare the ground for the telescopes of the future. Bold ideas abound. The participants listen to lectures on telescopes of 10-metre diameter. Some even want to build 25-metre telescopes. It also becomes clear that completely new technological concepts are necessary to realise such big telescopes. The conference spurs the imagination of Europe's astronomers. In ESO's house journal, The Messenger, famous scientists discuss the research prospects of a truly giant instrument. But in spite of these thrilling opportunities, little effort is spent on finding a fancy name. Europe's astronomers simply call their super telescope the VLT, the Very Large Telescope. Studies. And then we had that conference, we learned what was going on elsewhere in the world, and that encouraged us to really begin serious work on the whole issue. And on the one hand, we decided that we wanted not to make a small step forward, but really to make a big step of a factor 10 or something of that order of magnitude. A working group in Europe starts to investigate the possible concepts applicable to the VLT. Four main ideas are under discussion. One is to construct a telescope with a single 16-metre mirror, but to cast and polish a single 16-metre dish is considered an impossible technological feat. The second idea is therefore to construct the mirror in segments and mount them together. A totally different approach is to construct either 16 4-metre telescopes or four 8-metre instruments in an array and then combine their light. Together, they would have the same mirror surface as a 16-metre telescope. This concept gives flexibility as each telescope can be used independently and used together it will be possible to combine the light so that the VLT may function as a giant optical interferometer and produce exceedingly sharp images. The working group soon recognizes the great potential of an array of four 8-meter telescopes. So we started defining the scientific objectives preliminary designs of a VLT, and those were presented at a conference in Carges, in Corsica, in May 83. And actually the proposal from ESO was very well received by the European astronomical community at that time, and that gave us really some push to go ahead with that telescope. And progress... But it is not yet known whether the array solution is technically feasible, nor how it compares with other possibilities. An in-depth technical study is needed. ESO therefore sets up a dedicated in-house VLT project group, headed by ESO senior optical engineer, Dr. Daniel N.R. Soon, engineers and scientists are busy with feasibility studies. Some are carried out at ESO, some contracted out to European industry. The group also receives support from several specialized working groups and a scientific panel under the chairmanship of Jean-Pierre Swings. Many active scientists in ESO's member countries participate in this work. The scientific community in Europe takes a strong interest in the VLT project. Meanwhile, the search begins for an adequate site for the future telescope. What is to become the world's biggest astronomical telescope clearly deserves the very best location. A number of possible sites are identified in the northern Atacama Desert in Chile. Advanced site testing equipment is deployed on remote mountaintops with small dedicated ESO teams who monitor the observational conditions day and night. To work under the merciless sun and during the cold nights is a hard job but it is of crucial importance to the project. Their work continues for more than six years before the site is finally chosen, an unparalleled effort in the history of astronomy.
Back in Europe, the project group presents its work to the scientific community at a meeting in Venice in 1986. The group prefers the four eight-metre telescope concept, which is now commonly accepted. The Venice conference confirms that ESO is on the right track, technologically and scientifically. Definitely in Europe, the Very Large Telescope w was uh, on the air in the astronomical community. In March 1987, the time has come for the official 300-page VLT proposal to be submitted to the governments of ESO's member countries. It's well received. And at its historic meeting in December 1987, ESO's council formally decides to build the VLT. It has taken exactly 10 years to transform the vague idea of a super telescope into the fully approved and financed VLT project. Many new ideas have emerged during these years. Now is the time for detailed discussions with industry about the practical realization of this huge project. In particular, the exact configuration of the four eight-meter telescopes will depend on the choice of the site. In December 1990, ESO's council decides that the VLT shall be built on Ferro Paranal, an isolated mountain top about 120 kilometers south of the Chilean town of Antofagasta and 12 kilometers inland from the Pacific coastline. Paranal is situated in the driest part of the Atacama Desert. It has an extremely stable climate which offers optimal conditions for astronomical observations and 350 clear nights every year. But the summit of Paranal is rather narrow and cannot accommodate the huge VLT without a considerable amount of landscaping. 28 metres of the mountaintop must be removed to create a platform big enough for the telescopes. Furthermore, there is no water, only poor dirt roads in the area, and the wind can be very strong. So, by adding all the things up together, we have come to the conclusion that probably the best location for the control building is here. And Before the bulldozers the move in, construction manager Peter de Jonge presents the plans at ESO's headquarters in Garching in Germany. A complete infrastructure with buildings, roads, electricity, heating plants and water tanks must be created in the middle of the arid Atacama Desert to support the VLT observatory and its staff. Innumerable drawings are made, drafts written and rewritten, while data continue to be collected. At this stage, ESO's new technology telescope, or NTT, plays a vital role. This telescope, which has now entered into operation at ESO's La Silla Observatory, is not just another telescope. It also serves as a test bed for some of the new technologies to be used at the VLT. First used on the NTT, the ingenious concept of active optics, developed at ESO by Dr. Ray Wilson, will also be applied to the VLT. But other questions must be answered. How will the creation of a platform on Paranal and the telescope buildings themselves influence the wind flow around the mountain? Which type of domes are best suited to withstand the wind without creating local turbulence? Detailed wind tunnel tests provide some of the answers. In one case, even a 15-meter test dome is constructed at La Silla in Chile. Perfect. Oh, the picture is clear now. It's the ambition of ESO's engineers not only to build the biggest but also the best telescope in the world. To stay at the forefront of science and technology dictates the need for flexible project handling. But the basic concept, unchanged since the middle of the 80s, still seems the best one. The VLT will consist of four telescopes, with main mirrors of 8.2 meters diameter. The mirrors will be very thin, only 17 centimeters. To avoid flexure, they will rest on a computer-controlled support system which will keep the mirrors in perfect shape and position at all times. 
This idea is known as active optics and has already been demonstrated with great success with ESO's new technology telescope. The telescopes will be housed in compact buildings which will turn with them. This type of building gives effective wind protection and also ensures that there is no air turbulence around the telescope, which might degrade the observing conditions. The buildings will be placed in a trapezoidal configuration, so that all telescopes are exposed to the same wind conditions. Even more important, in this way the VLT can also function as a giant interferometer. The maximum sharpness or resolution, as astronomers call it, of the VLT images is determined by the distance between the individual telescopes. For the VLT, the maximum distance is 130 meters. Used in the interferometric mode, it will therefore yield a resolution as if it were a 130 meter telescope. For instance, it will be able to see objects of only a few meters in size at the distance of the moon. This, however, requires that the light from the telescopes is combined coherently. To achieve this is a tremendous challenge. To obtain the best possible interferometric images, the four large telescopes will be supplemented by movable 1.8-metre telescopes mounted on tracks. Thus, the optical system can be adapted to the different types of observations. The light beams from all the telescopes are combined in the underground interferometric laboratory. By increasing the maximum distance between the small telescopes further, it's possible to increase the image sharpness to equal that of a 200-meter telescope. This would, in principle, make it possible to detect individual astronauts on the surface of the Moon. The super-resolution of a 200-metre telescope will allow fantastic astronomical observations, but before this can really happen, another fundamental problem must be solved. As the light from a star passes through the atmosphere, the corresponding wavefront is deformed by air turbulence. We see this effect every night when we watch the twinkling of the stars. Until now, the effective resolution of large astronomical telescopes has been limited by this atmospheric turbulence. Fortunately, ESO and French research institutes have jointly developed a system which is capable of correcting the deformed wavefront of the light. Called adaptive optics, the principle is based on the application of a flexible mirror controlled by an extremely fast computer. A part of the light which arrives at the telescope is reflected into an image analyzer. The deformation of the wavefront is measured and the flexible mirror corrects it. The flexible mirror will change shape as soon as the atmospheric turbulence causes the wavefront to change again. The image is therefore corrected all the time and remains as sharp as possible. Here is a real observation of a star performed with the adaptive optics prototype device, uncorrected and corrected. Sharp images also mean a better concentration of the faint light from distant objects and the possibility of observing fainter objects than would otherwise have been possible. The ground-based telescope thus performs as if it were in space, with the disturbing effects of the atmosphere removed. The VLT holds great promises for scientists. It also poses an enormous challenge to industry. The collaboration with ESO provides a strong impetus to European industry in important fields of high technology. To give you the jointly agreed press release which will go out to all the media. Before the VLT project, no one had ever attempted to cast an 8-metre telescope mirror. The Schott Glassworks in Germany had to invent new methods to be able to meet the requirements of ESO. A new plant was needed for the production of the mirrors and novel techniques were used to cast and handle the giant glass blanks. Also at Reosk in Paris, where these blanks are to be polished from 1993, the VLT project has sparked off intense activities 
A new building and a 32-metre tall test tower has been built to test the polished mirrors. The giant mirrors must be polished to a precision in the order of a 20,000th of a millimetre. In Italy, the AES consortium joined forces to build the gigantic structures for the telescopes. Each of them will weigh more than 440 tonnes, yet they must be machined to sub-micron precision. Working under ESO contracts, a group of leading national research institutes will spend 170 man-years in developing the first two of the highly sophisticated auxiliary instruments for the VLT. Working on his boat-turned office in Copenhagen, the architect is busy designing the buildings for the VLT observatory. He works in close collaboration with the engineers from Kowi Consult, who are responsible for the infrastructure needed to keep the observatory functioning. Wind and sunlight will be the prime energy sources for this highly sophisticated observatory to be implanted in the remote South American desert. While engineers and technicians are busy in Europe, the Dutch company Interbeton prepares the site at Paranal. It is a hard and dirty job to create the telescope platform. We have been here uh, some very nice days, but uh, in the beginning we had terrible days with uh, hard, very hard winds, icy temperatures in the night far below zero, and during the day just because the wind very hard. The people are working here um, yeah, with lots of, lots of problems, especially for the clim climate. The wind is, is, a, is a difficult part. Besides it is the cold, the men are completely clothed and uh, <laughs> it's hard to move. It's just a very special uh, thing to work here, yeah. A lot of dust, logically, and a uh, quarry operation brings it with it. That's about it. Some 350,000 cubic meters of soil and rock must be removed from the mountain top. And at ESO's headquarters in Garching, program manager Massimo Terengi and his team are busy coordinating all the activities to ensure that the project stays within the time and budgetary limits. Some of the world's leading experts in optics and optomechanical systems are members of the team. They will spend an estimated 800 man years to create one of the most advanced science instruments ever built by man. December 1991. The Council, ESO's ruling body, visits Paranal to monitor the progress of the site preparation. They are confronted with a dusty building site, but they do not lose sight of the goal, to be achieved in 1999 when Europe's very large telescope will open its eyes towards the sky. What you want from a telescope is to see things which are very far away, because when you think, uh, see things which are very far away, you see also in the far past. As you know, it's a little bit like receiving a letter, which doesn't tell you how the people who have sent you the letter are feeling now, but how they felt when they wrote the letter. In the same way, when we get a signal from the sky, it left long time ago, and if you can see something which is very far in distance, with such a big telescope, you can see things as they were in the past. This telescope, for instance, may provide a clue to the birth of the galaxies. The other thing is that it will provide a very sharp vision, which will be enhanced in various ways, but that is what you want to have. I mean, you want to have the details of celestial bodies, you want to have the details of how galaxies look like, details of what exists in the core of the galaxies. 
uh, new telescopes often lead to new eras of astronomy like Galileo's first use of his telescope, like the first introduction of the big telescopes in California, in particular to mention the 5 meter telescope. And sure, VLT will be extremely important in this respect and I would say even particularly promising, not just because it is for 8 meter telescopes, but because the new uh, developments in optics, I'm thinking of uh, active and adaptive optics, which ma make this very large telescope to approach performances which you could otherwise only do with a space telescope. What does the VLT offer astronomers? Uh, it provides a research machine which has enormous diversity and flexibility. The VLT can do almost any kind of observation that astronomers want to do, from the ultraviolet to the infrared, whether that be astrometric or photometric, uh, very high resolution imaging, ultra high resolution imaging using the interferometric mode, where you can see where the sharpness and where the spatial definition that is completely unprecedented in optical and infrared astronomy. Because it has so many, such diverse instruments, such a large number of superior observing modes, we can expect a host of new surprises, a great deal of excitement. And what can mankind expect from the VLT? I think the world community can expect to share in the surprises, in the excitement, and therefore I think the VLT um, although of crucial importance for the future of European astronomy, is at the same time a very exciting exploring station uh, for mankind out there in the heart of the Atacama Desert. The VLT constitutes a technological leap forward comparable to the first use of an astronomical telescope by Galileo 400 years ago. When Galileo trained his telescope on the sky, he discovered a whole new world. And using the largest telescope of his time, Edwin Hubble showed that the universe extends far beyond the limits of our own galaxy. It's thanks to them and other astronomers that today we have a better understanding of the universe. With new and better instruments, they explored the unknown space around us. And soon, the VLT will enable today's astronomers to travel even further into the great unknown, beyond all current frontiers. With the VLT, they will test their ideas and discover new and strange phenomena. Nobody knows what they may be.